Cannabis Farm Award last night. So it's here, give it up. She has bred uh, some amazing cultivars, including Pink Boost Goddess, who has the highest THCV I've ever seen in my life. And um, watching her work is just incredible. She she's able to uh, connect with the plants in a very spiritual way that I I very much resonate with. And and it was magic watching you work in the garden and the way that you communicate with plants and the way that you pay attention to both science and the spiritual aspect of it is, is something that uh, is, is very dear to my heart. And uh, I think it is an important part of the future for cannabis medicine. And th yeah, that combination is so powerful. So thank you. We also have uh, Jackson, one of my favorite people in the world, honestly, the, one of the you know, most profound breeders when it comes to flavor. It's just so thoughtful. Um, I could talk to him maybe longer than almost anyone. I, I've killed my phone talking to him multiple times, actually. Like, we're just, like, in the garden doing stuff. I'll be doing, the, you know, doing some breeding work or gardening, and, like, we'll be talking about dreams and breeding and past histories, and all of a sudden my phone's dead three and a half hours later. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, very honored to have him here. I, I, I want him on every genetics panel I ever do, for sure. Um, we got Todd McCormick, who's uh, just an absolute legend and uh, an important preservationist. He really believes in the importance of understanding the primary colors of, of cannabis, what we are working with. Uh, his, his work in, um, on, on maintaining original hazes, the Skunk One, the OGs, uh, and the, the Northern Lights. It's, 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 you know, these are, these are very important pieces that uh, actually this entire industry is based off of. And so thank you for the work that you've done for preservation. And we got, Ed, yeah, well, yeah, you can clap, let's do it, let's do it, let's clap for everyone right now. And, and we got Ed Rosenthal, who um, I just really have to commend you on your bravery, because nobody was doing the work of putting forth cannabis information, and um, yeah, I mean, just at a time where it, it was dangerous to actually publish things, you were making sure that people understood about this plant, and yeah, well, thank you for that work and that bravery, it's, it's, done a lot for this community and so let's let's big round of applause for all these amazing people. Thank you and happy 420. <laughs> Yay, it's 420. Perfect time for the genetics panel, right? Um, should we be smoking? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, let's start off with uh, Katie Jean. Um, you know, we talk about cannabis as a female plant all the time and I, I do think, you know, there's such a strong essence. It's, it's wonderful to celebrate the divine feminine through cannabis, but um, there is the male counterpart too. Uh, and, and I think the future of cannabis, both medicine, materials, and just our mutualistic evolution together, we, we can't forget that actually males are a part of this as well. And, and hearing that from you, it, it was very profound and, and wonderful. I'd love to hear you speak to that a little bit. Well, in my work with cannabis, you know, working with the female plants and, and sitting with them and, and being in meditation with them, um, you know, I was just thinking about what an animal plant, um, you know, what an animal plant is, you know, it goes through this life cycle and it, it grows and it flowers and then it produces a seed and then it, it dies and comes back again. And then our work with cannabis to produce flowers, we're stopping that process and so then the, the, the seed isn't happening. And I was feeling how that is, you know, that, that's a real challenge for, for the spirit of cannabis to have to go through that, that process and be kind of denied its, its natural life cycle. And so that, um, as that awareness came to me, and I, I've always worked with males and always um, done my own breeding, but as that awareness came to me in a, a stronger way, I just really felt the importance of, of honoring those male cannabis plants and really receiving their gifts and um, you know honoring the way that I'm growing them and um, you know having them you know and I live in Mendocino County so you know they're grown deeper in the forest I kind of imagine that they're on a vision quest you know because they're you know the female plants are in the garden they get a lot of care and they get a lot of attention and the male plants are grown deeper in the forest you know they're not getting as much attention and nutrition and water and, and all of that the soil is just native um, and so in that process, you know, they're able to have a deeper connection with the spirit world. And the way that it, it kind of came to me from the plants is that in that process, then they're able to kind of, the males are able to bring in these new medicines um, for the people at this time. And so by being in relationship with that, it allows, you know, this, this new medicine to come down. Um, and, you know, and so then kind of weaving that in and, and you know, growing as many males as I can and bringing those as much pollen into the garden as I can and making as many 
like your beginnings and your connection with the plant, why you do what you do. I mean, it's kind of, it's a bit of an obsession you know, that I, I share too, but it, it's a passion, but you're, you have a thoughtful, calculating, and just beautiful way that you go about it. Maybe tell us a bit about your connection with it. Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, so I um, grew up around the plant, and when I was really, uh, when I was really little, it was I, I, I did really enjoy um, really being around it because it was like uh, more of a fearful thing and going on. Oh, but you know, I wish we weren't growing weed and hiding it and all that. But as soon as I got to a certain point, like in my um, early teens or like 10 years old, uh, um, I started to appreciate it. And so around that time, I started to actually like, you know, want to learn to, you know, grow joints and check stuff out and learn about the plants. And it, it was, it was uh, I think I was probably 10 or 11 and I read, uh, I read uh, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And that really got me like educated Jack to be, yeah, Jack Hare. Um, to, to realize like the value that it wasn't just this, you know, my perspective of it was that, you know, uh, we grow pot, you can't tell anybody, and we're probably, as far as I knew, we're some of the only people who get it because back then nobody would tell you. So um, as I got a little older, um, in like our mid-teens, you started to realize that actually your, your friends' parents all grow weed pretty much. You start to find a little bit of weed, or you start to see the gardens, or um, and then uh, they're not just all landscapers. Well, I mean, <laughs> it, technically, it's it's landscaping. You know, it's not split hairs. But yeah, uh, yeah. So um, you know, from from there, then I started to get get the interest in and um, in seeing how people were able to. Uh, you know, keep stuff around and have seeds and all the variety. And it, it just seemed really exciting to me to be able to um, to be able to have something. It's like you you. Uh, it's not instant gratification, but it's pretty fast to be able to take something and make more seeds and you know pick the ones you want and see how it leads that direction and combine things and see the middle ground and be able to take it in different ways. And that was that was really like where my enthusiasm came from and um, and then that you know led into enthusiasm for other species of plants and all that kind of stuff but basically like um, I just you know, I just fell in love with plants in general and it was such like a, a, a thing you could really do and see see happen and I just always like was there was there a moment what was what was your first cross what was that moment that you just fell in love um well initially my buddy gave me seeds and um, him and his dad were at the kitchen table and he said, okay, we ripped off some little pieces of paper and some foil and said, okay, this is gonna be number one, this is number two, this is number three. He didn't really tell me what they were. They didn't really have names, but they were different things he liked from his harvest that year. And I grew like number four, so I think smelled like orange juice. Number three was kind of like a, like a Hindu Kush, OG Kush, lime smelling type thing with that really gnarly structure where it was no leaves. It was just um, and those things and then um, so I grew those and at the same time around them he gave me these other things that they call uh, Dirt Big Bud and Dirt Perk, two different crosses of this Afghan and, um, and then uh, as soon as I started playing with those a little bit I was just amazed because that was really perfumey uh, deep crazy smell and um, that was like as soon as I as soon as I made more of those seeds and planted them and some smelled like cotton candy and some smelled like grape juice and I was just amazed and that was like when I really like you know basically as soon as I started I had the luck of having these really good seeds and so it just it just you know I just wanted to do it and do it from there. Your your nose and your palate and your your memory for cannabis is like no one else I've ever seen to and I'm somebody who is like that but like I've never met anyone on on the level of your memory like you smell something and, and you can rem it takes you back to all these different places that it's just something that always stuns me like you're you're I, I get you're those, I get those pictures you know like I get a you get that they say like that of all, all the senses the smell can kind of transport your consciousness to like a certain time and place so that's so if you 
you can like smell a certain incense and go, oh, they have that in that store, you know? And, and just for me, I think it's a little bit more uh, developed, but like it's definitely, smell in general for humans is like really powerful. I think you started off with uh, yeah, a lot of it innately, but like maybe well practiced. But thank you. <laughs> so Todd, um, want to talk a bit about yeah, the primary colors of, of cannabis, you know, like the, the varieties that we're seeing today and why you do your preservation work with the hazes and the skunks and the NL5s and um, the weeds. Sure, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be up here. Uh, when I was a little kid, I had cancer and my mom started um, getting me high back in 1979 when I was going through chemo and radiation and a couple years, a few years later in January of 1984, I traded a twenty dollar bag of pot for a Ed Rosenthal and Mel Frank grow book, <laughs> and uh, my life was forever changed. Like yeah. I came home and cleaned up my closet. And then a few years later, ironically, I sell seeds made by his old partner, Mel Frank, and um, and I have questions about favorite poison for you because you're the one who went and found it. But um, so <clears throat> I've had a unique uh, situation. I read Jack Harris book back in 1993, blew my mind. Uh, for a long time, I felt stigmatized by being a cannabis user, and that that really vindicated my feelings, gave me the sense of history and the sense of worth that cannabis had and the history of things. Changed my life, changed my view. I went up, met Jack, we became best friends, and. Uh, I became an editor of the book in 1994 until he passed away. I put out the 12th edition after he passed away with memorials in it to Jack, of course. And if you haven't read his book yet, I recommend you pick up a copy and read it because it's life changing. It's not just about cannabis, it really creates a hub for the entire history of, of, of all things tree paper and fabrics and ropes and petrochemicals. And it gives you good perspective, and I highly recommend it. Can we get a round of applause for Jack and send him to the energy and love? For sure. Um, but because I was with Jack, I got basically a backstage pass to most of the cannabis industry starting early on, uh, going to the very first cannabis cups in 1994 in Amsterdam that were open to the public and being able to meet these great people. Um, Skunkman Sam, Rob Clark was in the room, Marijuana Botany, Ashish. These were the books that, you know, we couldn't go to college and learn the stuff that guys like Ed and Mel and Robert were putting out. So I was really grateful. These were my heroes. I mean, these are the people I looked up to. These were my teachers, you know, and, and when I met them, I was all the more thrilled with them to find out they were really good people. But because of that, I also ended up inheriting a lot of the genetics. Um, Mel Frank's Sturban Poison, Afghan One, Smithman Sam's Original Skunk Number One, Original Haze, which was kept as an IBL, uh, Original Haze was first bred in 1969 in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, Sam saw the unique variety, he kept it as an IBL, which is an inbred line, and he kept it isolated away from the Afghan, which is uh, quite a feat, because now every single thing we smoke has Afghan influence in it. It's really difficult, if not impossible, to find genetics that don't have Afghan in it. Um, and what I was able to do is start to collect these genetics from the original sources, Skunkman Sam, Mel Frank, and then later Greg McAllister, who is the gentleman who gave Northern Lights to Neville back in 1984. Uh, he was a Vietnam vet, came back from Nam in 69, started studying, growing cannabis, and um, there was a book called uh, How to Grow Marijuana Indoors Under Lights by Murphy Stevens. And Murphy Stevens had a hydroponic shop up in Seattle, and a good Afghan variety, and he had a blessing Greg McAllister with it back in 1979, and that purist indica, as they called it, became the very backbone of, of Northern Lights and what we now refer to as OG Kush, that's most likely a derivative of Northern Lights number two, which was purist indica across with the uh, Afghans Greg was finding. And years later, when his sister passed away, they found some seeds in his freezer, or her freezer, and his family sent them to him, and he sent me some of them, so we ended up getting Northern Lights number five, number two, and the purist indica. And what, what I'm working to do is preserve these genetics because things like haze were lost in the 70s because the people that were growing them, um, cannabis is what's considered an obligate outcrosser. It's just like humans. You don't want to have sex with your cousins. You know, you want to keep the, the, the genetics fresh so that you're not getting mutants and problems and everything. Same goes with cannabis breeding. And um, realistically, while they were basically through the 70s outcrossing haze every year, by the end of the 70s, they all but lost the original variety. And 
a lot of them just move towards more convenient varieties such as Skunk One because you know if you're up in Santa Cruz and you can either harvest in September or you can harvest in December, uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. You're going to pull down plants that you know will come down before the frost and then you can cash out on and you know, successfully harvest. So a lot of people moved away from these varieties and unfortunately people didn't see the uniqueness and didn't see the necessity to preserve these genetics before they were basically mixed up with other things. And now what we're seeing in cannabis is a lot of people breeding with plants that have very similar genetics. So we're not moving very far away from where we are, um, from the candies and the, the fruitiness, because we don't have these unique outcrossable genetics, these dissimilar genetics to cross with. And unless we start bringing these into the community and start making fresh crosses, we're just reshuffling the deck over and over and over again. So what I've been working to do is uh, bring original haze back, original skunk one back, original turban from Mel Frank, Afghani one, and now Northern Lights. And you know, I call these the primary colors of cannabis because back in the 70s, those were the plants that were mixed up and became a lot of the modern varieties that we celebrate and we smoke today. Um, and they're all great, don't get me wrong, I mean, I love the turkey combinations, but now that we have legalization and we can start to cultivate varieties that flower in, let's say, 10 to 16 weeks rather than all of them under 10 weeks, we can really start to uncover more flavors, more terpene combinations, more cannabinoid combinations, and hopefully with it more inspiration. I would give it like the comparison to a box of Crayola crayons. So if you had a box of 16 crayons, you can get a little more creative than if you have a box of eight Crayola crayons. And this is what, you know, basically I'm telling people they should start looking at longer flowering varieties. They should learn the sea of green. They should learn how to cultivate the more tropical equatorial varieties and mix them into the more faster flowering Afghan genetics that they're working with today. So they can really start making some varieties that we're not seeing right now because unfortunately, especially being a judge, you see a lot of homogenous cannabis, man. You can see a hundred samples at some of these events and they're not very dissimilar, you know? And it's because unfortunately we're limited by the environment we grow in and we're limited by the genetics that we can get our hands on. And hopefully now, me and Edward just sitting here talking about somebody was selling seeds from Northern India and he was really excited about it. He picked up some seeds himself because this is kind of what we need. We need, you know, fresh blood coming in, so to speak. We need the Colombian genetics, the Mexican genetics. We need the Indian genetics. We need these things to start coming back into the community so we can share them and work with them and hopefully improve upon what we already have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And, and what are some questions that you really love about Hayes? Well, Hayes to me is really exceptional. I first smoked it in 1994 when I, when I visited the Canvas Castle with Jack Herrick. I had been growing and smoking cannabis that was a majority Afghan, he skunky for 10 years, and it was the first time I experienced a, a type of cannabis that was more like a morning coffee than it was like, you know, an evening night quill. And uh, I really love OG Kush, I love Afghans and such, but, you know, I smoked cannabis all day when I was a little kid, I had a spinal fusion when I was only two years old, so I felt, I dealt with chronic pain my whole life, so I smoked like a chimney, I'd be smoking right now if I could. but. Uh, the, the thing is, is that being able to smoke things like haze, you can have really productive days, you can have a real clear high, you can have high energy. It's, it's really like a different thing. It's like a day quill as opposed to a night quill. And I, you know, I love my Afghans, they're great at night when you're sitting in a hot tub and you're just relaxing, but you know, something about smoking a haze first thing in the morning, I mean, you'll get up, you'll do your dishes, you'll start vacuuming and, you know, realize, shit, I haven't even had breakfast. And you know, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of cool. I highly recommend people play with them. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. And I'd like to say this about Hayes. It's actually a three-way Colombian variety. And uh, because it's a narrow leaf drug variety, a lot of people confuse the fact that they think all tropical equatorial cannabis that's narrow leaf is Hayes, and that's not the case. I mean, you can get anything from around the equator that's a narrow leaf drug type variety. Um, but unless it's a three-way Colombian or, you know, derivative of that, it's really not Hayes. Yeah, thank you for that distinction. I think a lot of people need to keep that in mind. And um, so, Ed, you just came out with a new book, and it's it's beautiful. It's very comprehensive. Um, you know, I read the the breeding section. It's actually called Basic Breeding, but it goes deep into all kinds of stuff. You know, like specifics of backcrossing and F generations. You even go into um, breeding uh, uh, tetraploids with biploids to make triploids. It's
it's a little bit more than basic, but uh, I really appreciate all the information that you put down and that. And um, yeah, could you tell us a little bit about your book and what you thought was really important to uh, get out there for people to know and a little bit about the breathing section? Um, you wouldn't buy a 10 year old computer book. And cannabis cultivation has changed so much that, uh, especially in the past 10 years, that the old techniques and the old tools, the old methods, the old assumptions aren't relevant today anymore. Because there's a new set of, uh, we've learned a lot more about cannabis, a lot more about how it grows, a lot more about how plants grow, or photosynthesis, and uh, this book applies all, all of this new information into uh, what the old, uh, the older book, but it, so, but rather than just uh, doing patchwork, uh, I put together a team that included uh, Dr. Rob Flannery, who uh, uh, runs Dr. Rob Farms and has a PhD from Davis. And uh, then we, as my co-author, and then we brought in uh, specialists in each area. And they were either uh, from universities or from the industry. And so this book is not it has my name on it, but it's really a collaborative effort of dozens, literally dozens of people who contributed information to it, including Mel Frank. Yeah. And so um, we think uh, Rob and I wanted to put together something that would be understandable to somebody who has never grown a plant before, doesn't know how a green plant works, to uh, people who have been in the industry for quite a long time. And part of that is that there's a lot of new information that just wasn't available 10 years ago. And that's in dealing especially with writing, fertilization, and uh, plant morphology. So on the book. Awesome, thank you. Uh, um, good. So one other thing is, you know, uh, years ago, uh, I, uh, I came out with a book that had basically a black cover with a butt on it. And then before you do it, you know, every, all the, so many of these books had black covers with a butt on it. And so I decided to leave it, you know, leave that to the people who didn't have their own creativity. And uh, so this is what the book looks like. Oh, boy. 
to like the smells that smell like poop. Unless it's cannabis, I do like the poop. Yeah, now everybody wants it. Now everybody romanticizes those. Alright. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Alright, so I'm gonna go with it. Katie Jean, you've done amazing work in breeding THCV and the Pink Boost Goddess, and um, it, it's actually kind of stunning how quickly the cannabinoids have, have raised risen on that. I think what you started with was maybe like around 1% or something like that, and then just in a few generations, you got to, what, 9 plus percent maybe? Um, and I think it's a testament to how quickly cannabis is ready to work with us mutualistically when we're in tune, uh, both spiritually and doing science. And could you tell us a bit about that process and where she came from? Um, well, let's see. Um, I was gifted with some seeds in 2015 um, um, from a woman, Erin, Erin and Jean, and they, the previous year, had been gifted with some seeds from Linda Lou. Um, and Erin tested one of her plants, and it came back high into the CV, and she actually didn't um, pollinate that plant, she pollinated another one. Um, and I was able to get my hands on some of that seed. Um, I'd done a lot of work with CBD, and, and so I had a strong practice in vegetative ratio work, and, um, and was excited to sort of dive into a new project. And so I got my hands on that seed, and then I, I kind of collected a bunch of other seed as well um, from various sources. And um, I didn't really find any CBD anywhere else, but in that one batch of seed, um, from Aaron, about 2% of the seeds um, had THCV in them. And it was around 2%, it was, it was a little bit higher than one. And then I also got um, a few males that had a little bit in there too. And so then I just started, you know, kind of working with the science selection and then working with, um, you know, with, with intuition a bit as well. Um, and basically what I've just seen is that, you know, it's here. Um, by doing that work and, and working with that tool of science to find out what um, concentrations are in the leaf um, when they're in veg, um, I was kind of able to, to select and keep reading forward. Did they start as, a, these are really beautiful plants, the, um, the stigma, the, the hairs on the, the flowers are bright pink and gorgeous. Did it start that way? You know, it, um, it was in there, but it wasn't stabilized in it. And I've actually seen through the years this year, it's actually the most stable. Last year, it actually wasn't there as much, and I was kind of a little bit disappointed. And so I was quite surprised this not year. not Yeah, this year to see it like there um, almost exclusively. There's only and, one plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to see them, and yeah, it was pretty much all of them. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Thank you. Jackson, um, what are you working on right now? What's the, what are you excited about? Um, this this year I tried to with everything I try to like um, have a few things that are um, the most special that I have from over the years and then I do work with them out crossing to other stuff but um, like my favorite uh, thing is my line and so I've been I love that line yeah I've been trying to open it up by taking a bunch of different males and going back to my favorite clone. Um, so that I can have a bunch of different directions without going too far. Like I bred it, I took the F1 clone and I bred it with um, with F2 uh, males and um, I bred it with F3 males and I bred it with F5 males. But this year I did making a back crossover over again. Or? Yeah, so like taking taking the taking the original and then breeding it forward and then pulling males out of those and putting them back on the original clone. But then this last time what I did was I did the, like the, the second back cross, um, going back to that original plant. So I did it um, 10 different ways and then I kept the males. So I can go through all of them and see which ones go where and uh, you know. What are some of the profiles you're most excited about from the There was a really recent. cool one that was like, um, really really bright bright sweet citrus but not really orange like it's almost like a like a vague citrus thing where you're like there's no citrus fruit that's like this but it's like creamy orange lime kind of you know like a little bit of like 
grapefruit, but not, you know, it's it's like its own thing, but it's this candy thing, like it's like a citrus punch candy. And then there was like a couple of cool ones that were like, um, uh, and these are like, these are the, the sisters of the males that I put back on the clone. So I also bred them. And then I have them too. So there's like, those are the forward ones and that, that, that I went back to. But um, there was some, there was one that was like really, really like artificial pink lemonade. And there was one that was like, um, smelled like sweet tea with like a little bit of lemon in it, but mostly just like sweet tea. And there was one that smelled trippy enough, it smelled like a lot like Pepsi. It was really trippy, you know, like, was, yeah, in there. So, um, you know, I have all those, I have the seeds from in them, and then I re them, I have them still alive. I have all the males I use, and then, uh, so like I can dig through to kind of go in those different directions. But those ones, those were kind of the standouts. And then there's a couple like that I, that I think of as just being like the original black lime where it's a lot of that crazy weird chemical funk and then you, you sent me some of the, the Mercot lime, like the, it's like that um it's a lime that you use for like cooking it's really intense, like a small amount like overpowers. But I was I was pretty blown away. I was like, oh my god, that's kinda of there, but it had to do with that cleaning product too. Like yeah. where did that come from? So that came from I think from the Northern Lights, but it was in Northern Lights, Afghani, Oaxacan and the um the Oaxacan is a really chemical heavy kind of thing, like a, like pe pe people, like, you know, terpenaline and, and pinene and like, but really, really sharp. Oh, Limony too. Yeah, and then, um, and, and pine, and the pine, yep. you know? And then the Afghani was more like, more like in the ballpark of like kind of bubba-ish, but more sweet. And then the Northern Lights that we had was like really plain but super resinous and super powerful and, and smoked kind of piney like if you have mash from it. So um, after those got bred together a little bit, they got like really nasty floor cleaner, like, you know, freshly cleaned bathroom, just that like crazy combination of those chemical smells. And then the other side of it was all like the citrusy stuff. So when they got put together, those stuck together and then they tend to travel together. It's kind of hard to get them. So usually if you get like a really citrusy one, it still has this really nasty, deep, dark, earthy, mossy funk. But those are, so that's like those ones. And then, uh, and then I did the cherry lime and remixes. Oh, cool. So that those same males I used on the limes, I used them on the cherry too. So I have like, you know, 10 of the limes, 10 of the cherry limes. And then I put those on a couple other things, and then that was like the um, excuse me, that was like the um, you know, those were like my early kind of like real focused breeding, and then I did a bunch of other stuff too. And you also did the cherry lime pop too. What's the, what's the difference there? So the cherry lime pop was like the first try at like a remix of it. So taking that same cherry bomb and then putting a different uh, lime mail on it, and so that was the. So that was like the next version, but those ones were like way better plants, way chunkier, more consistent, and more consistently sweet and desirable, but sexually super unstable. And uh, but I mean, everybody else has made tons of good stuff with it. Yeah, I, I just think I'm still like working with the with the in cross, but yep. when it gets hybridized, they mostly come out super stable. Yeah, I found that too, and I had a lot of fun. Yeah, working with that and, and putting the stable black dog on that, the cherry lime dog, like. The flavors that came out, and then doing that work to stabilize uh, the intersex yeah. you know, issues, like it, it actually happened really quick. And it's been yeah. a joy to work with. Yeah. So the year before, um, I did also. I took your black dogs that you gave me that were like back cross five or something, and I heard three. I think they're five though. I gave you the four, the BC five, and the BC five like two. So it was the five, and then I I put the gelato thirty three cherry limeade on that. Still need to try those. And those got grown out, and some of them had this really nice like. Banana ice cream yeah. smell that were really cool, and they were all like the, the, the combination because the black dog with that, those turps added to it that worked really good too. So I have those for you too. Oh, amazing! Awesome. Um, so, Todd, like you know, you do all the work for the preservation, um, but are you doing anything new? What's, what's new? What are you excited yeah, about? Yeah, um, of course. I mean, things like purple haze, and there's a lot of stuff that I've been able to start working on and playing with just because. You know, when I was a kid in the 80s, 
started growing pot. I read about Northern Lights and you know things like Haze and dream about them, you know. And now, and now I have them all, and it's just really crazy. So I've been having a blast with it, um, making some old favorites like Skunk and Haze, which has been done a zillion times ago by Skunk and Sam, but I made my own. Um, purple Haze is I've been playing with things with Northern Lights. I've also been playing with and. Um, you know, I just enjoy the whole process, and I would tell people that, you know, I would remind everybody that, you know, lab machines are not what's buying cannabis. It's what's really important is organoleptic testing, because it's it's up to you how you feel about it, how, how it moves you. And it's not just high THC numbers, it's really a, a synergistic effect with the terpenes, and I guess the thiols to some degree, and probably other chemicals that we're not discussing. But I, it, it saddened me to see this, like you know, statistical race to twenty or whatever percent. I don't even believe in thirty percent THC in plants. I mean, if you can look at a cannabis plant, think what about forty? One, oh God! <laughs> if you think one third of that plant is THC, you're higher than I am. And, and I think that, and that's a pretty, pretty impressive thing, you know. So. You know, I think that we need to get better standards in the way we test flowers. If we were to shake off the resin glands and then test the resin glands for cannabinoid content, that would be a lot more honest than the way people are, you know, basically fudging the test and, and coming up with absolute BS because it's turned not into a quality, it's turned into a quantity uh, test. And, and to me, you know, quality and quantity do not go hand in hand. And um, now that, you know, like his old partner Mel Frank has been able to test some of the varieties he's growing, he's been pretty surprised to find that lower THC varieties with higher terpene content um, gives him a, a better feeling than, than stuff that's just, you know, high, high, high THC. So I think the subtleties are really what we should be focusing on. I think bringing out the flavors, bringing out that overwhelming terpene presence. You know, we all talk about back in the day, pot used to smell so strong, someone would get in your car and you could smell that they had it on them and it's kind of changed. And what's changed is in the last 30 or so years of breeding, a lot of what the breeding became was what was convenient for the cultivator. They wanted faster, they wanted heavier, um, and, and that really didn't mean overall quality or, or strongest terpene content or overall feelings would be the best. It just meant that they cropped quick and they cropped heavy. And now that it's legal for a lot of us, every single adult in this room who lives in California could legally grow some pot without a license. You know, you don't have to be licensed to be legal in California. Um, and you should grow some pot and you should grow your own because I remind people, you know, cannabis doesn't come in a glass jar. It literally grows on trees and the best cannabis you'll ever smoke is the cannabis you grow yourself. You put love into it, you know that there's no chemical sprayed on it, you can walk it through harvesting and, and, and curing to the point where you appreciate it. That's really what it's all about, is that personal enjoyment, you know, and I'm kind of the anti-cannabis, cannabis corporation because I'm really trying to empower people. My activism now is putting the seeds in people's hands and giving them the opportunity to grow these legendary genetics that we've all heard about and, and, and giving them the joy that it's brought us. And, you know, I would also say, this is probably a tough room to say it in, but you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, competition and legalization and ruining the legacy movement and stuff, but if you truly believe in cannabis and you've been touched by cannabis the way I have and the way many people in this room have, you need to understand that the prices have to drop. If people are going to stop using pharmaceuticals and stop using alcohol, it's, that's only, it's only going to be because they can access cannabis at a reasonable price. If anybody came to you and tried to sell you organic broccoli for $1,600 a pound, you would probably laugh at them. And I think sometimes okay. we've forgotten, yeah, that you know, cannabis grows on trees and it shouldn't be so overpriced. And we really need to see it penetrating the society if it's gonna make society a better place. Yeah. And, and thank you for you know, saying that about you're growing your own, you're able to put love into it and then you get to have that consciousness altering, you know, flower be a part of you and the love that you put into it gets to return. Yeah. And, uh, and you get to share it. You know, this whole industry wasn't an industry. It was home growers. It was home growers growing a little more than they needed and selling it to their friends and their immediates. And that's, that was this industry. And that's what we kind of need to focus back on because, you know, the quality isn't going away. The first person who ever run the, won the Emerald Cup was an old man who had never grown pot before. It was the first year he ever grew and he blew away all the 
the old growers, and he was so old that he told Tim he didn't even want the award, told Tim to keep it. And, uh, but that's the true story of the very first Animal Cup that was ever won by a first time grower who just knew his shit in the garden. That's awesome. Thank you for that tidbit. That's fun. Did, did, did he stay anonymous or? Yeah, yeah, I don't, you know, I, Tim will tell you the story with the glow if you ever ask him. It's really worth listening to. But it just goes to show that, you know, what inhibited a lot of this was the illegality of it. You know, what kept the prices high is they were shooting our dogs. They were, I spent five years in fucking prison for growing flowers in my backyard because I wouldn't cooperate. And, and this is egregious, you know? It's like we shouldn't be prosecuted for growing flowers, you know? And now that we have the right to do it, we should act like it. And we should try to bring down the price, bring up the quality, encourage home growing, encourage sharing. That's what this community, in my opinion, should go back to and what it should be all about. Thank you for your bravery and your heart. So Ed, in the book, um, well, you're, you're talking about how, you know, 10 years ago, you know, it's not relevant now. There's so much more information. And you know, there's some important old information, but what, what um, anything stand out in the book, like, new that you really want the public to know? So, you know, uh, there are some new con or concepts in the book that weren't in previous books, and some of them deal with uh, daily light interval and how much light plants get over a period of 24 hours. And uh, then there's uh, uh, a lot of information on uh, 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 vapor pressure deficit. And that is, uh, it, it comes down to this that at different temperatures, different humidities would be best for the, for the plants and it's a curve and it goes deeply into those two things and if you if you had just so if for experienced growers if you had just those two chapters in the book it will change the way you grow so but the whole book is like that so it's not just one thing but i wanted to mention you know everybody was talking about what they were doing and I, i'm doing a, a few things first of all i'm doing i'm working on latitude-based agriculture so that you want to produce different uh, plants that will flower um, at different times, like quarterly, but at different times uh, depending on the latitude. And that can be used in a lot of different ways, uh, so many ways. Uh, but I'll just give you one instance. Let's say you had a big, big field and you wanted to harvest, you wanted to harvest, you wanted to go create a harvest situation that was easy. So if you had plants that came in that matured at different times so that you wouldn't need to rush all at once, that would be latitude-based agriculture. So let's say you had the same variety, but it comes in September 1st, another group comes in September 7th, another group comes in 14th, and so on. So, and then uh, the other thing is that everybody in Northern California, I would say, is growing wrong. And uh, the reason that I say that, <laughs> the, the reason that I say that is that you try to grow against, uh, against uh, changing weather in October and November, and you should you should harvest by September 15th. So if you're growing varieties that come in later than September 15th, you should abandon them and get varieties such as Superbug that comes in in this area around September 10th. But not just that variety, I'm not just pushing that variety. I'm saying that you're going to have a much better crop if you don't have to deal with weather. So if you're growing a plant that's putting you against um, against weather, you're growing the wrong plants, right? Yeah, the, the right genetics in the right place is really the key to a successful crop. Right. Yeah. Try and, to put and, and, up and, and so I know a lot of you are harvesting October 15th, October 10th, but you look and see what happens to the intensity of the sun at that time as compared with uh, August 15th or September 10th. And then you'll see why you're growing wrong. 
And so if you really want to make like Humboldt and other varieties from the Northern Triangle uh, competitive again, you, you have to um, change your growing methods. And um, it's as simple as that. And uh, well, that's one thing that I'm working on. And then the other thing is, I was actually supposed to be in, in, in India at this time, working for a company that was collecting seeds from uh, villages in India and Bhutan. And that's, what, that's where cannabis originated, so that's where you'll have the most diversity of genetics. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this pandemic has um, put that on hold for a little bit. But I think that's still important to do and uh, especially to collect uh, the genetics from areas that are still relatively unspoiled. And I'll give you two examples of spoiled areas. If you go down to Jamaica, you can't find any Jamaican weed there. Everything has been compromised by hybridization or just getting rid of it. So, uh, and if you go to Morocco, the uh, plants have changed substantially over 30 years because of all of the imported seeds that were brought in by uh, people buying hash from, from Morocco. And one example of that is that when I went to Morocco 30 years ago, I could not get high from the, from the hash. As much as I tried, it was so weak. You know, people would say, I have some good Moroccan, and I'd think, oh, that's a contradiction in terms. <laughs> But, but I went, when I went back there a couple of years ago, the plants looked substantially different, and it was because they had been interbred with uh, European and American varieties, and uh, you could actually get high from the hash. So, so, um, so uh, I'm working on that, but I think especially when, um, I'm especially interested in the uh, Hindu Kush Valley and the, the whole, uh, 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 plains right, right before the mountains where there are a lot of isolated villages and there's all of this cat diversity in cannabis because that's where it originated. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, somebody who's really amazing, I really hope someday to bring him here to Deepak um, of the Indian Land Race Seed Exchange. He goes by Razin on, on Instagram. Uh, you can find some of the most amazing information from an incredible preservationist. He goes to all these different places and has categorized things based off of, you know, where they're growing. Is it far north? You know, as you get to a certain uh, point north, you know, you get into an auto flower realm. Uh, is it in the desert? Is it high? Is it low? And, uh, you know, the plant has evolved all these different ways to deal with these environments. But he's an amazing preservationist who, who actually really gives back to all the communities he goes to. And was lucky enough to make it through Afghanistan before all this shit hit the fan. And, you know, it's very frightening to lose what's happening with everyone. And it's also a big deal to lose the, the genetic potential there, too. But he's saved a lot of things from that particular trip. But I encourage everyone to go to Indian Land Race Seed Exchange and see the work that he's doing. Um, one more point about... Uh, the, you know, the length of flowering times. I think with cannabis, there's a lot of different uh, end uses. And, you know, for hash varieties, a lot of times they will be later, but a lot of times they'll be more resistant too. So figuring out what works for you, whether you're, what product you're making, if you are growing for flowers, if you're growing for ice water hash, um, and your climate, you know, and really understanding the genetics that work with that is really important. And all these people up here have done amazing work towards that, and, and thank you all. Um, and, and thank you all for coming and being a part of this and, and being part of Canada's community. Thank you. Yes, if we could actually just go down, everyone, where can we find you? Um, I'm over in the Small Farmer area, Small Farmer Initiative at the Farm Cut Group. And on Instagram online, and your farm? Um, my farm is Emerald Spirit Botanicals. Any dispensaries that you're in that we can get um, Goose Goddess? You know, um, Soulful and Sebastopol just got a uh, delivery of Goose Goddess as well as Harmony Rose. How can we connect with you, Jackson? Any new releases, and how do people find you? 
Um, my uh, my Instagram is Mean Gene from Mendocino, all one word, no underscores, and um, my backup account is Freeborn Selections. And I have a couple things right now at Alpine Sea Group, their new uh, company that just launched. And um, for now, that's about it. And I guess you shared anything else? I'm just Todd P. McCormick on Instagram. AGC AGC company? AGC Co. on Instagram. Thank you. Ed? Ed Rose with all that time. We'll take you through a lot of different sites. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.